Well, good morning, church, uh, and welcome to our neighbors. I'm glad to be together with you. If, uh, if we haven't met yet, my name is Michael, and I'm one of the pastors here at Neighborhood Church. And also, happy Mother's Day to our moms. Uh, or, yay! yay. <clears throat> we, don't, uh, we don't get here without them, and so we want to show them proper honor. Um, but I also am aware this morning, um, as much as a blessing as it is to be here, that uh, on a day like today, we remember that not everything is the way it should be in God's creation. Um, Sin has broken families and caused deep heartache, uh, and suffering in creation has led to suffering in the flesh and in our personal relationships. Um, And so there's a whole litany of emotions in in a celebration that I just would like to make a little bit of space for to address. And so um, I'm going to do that. I'm going to pray, which is not typically how we start, but if you'll let me to pray... Um, And then as I get to the end, I'll invite you to pray together with me uh, the the disciples' prayer, okay? So let's bow our heads together and let's pray. Hmm. Lord, on this Mother's Day, we thank you for our mothers, through whom you've given to us life and who have watched over us as we have grown. We recognize today that everything in your creation isn't as it should be, and so we lift up together the aching hearts of all those who long to be mothers, but mourn the absence of new life within them, the aching hearts of those who have conceived but suffered loss through miscarriage or abortion. We lift up the aching hearts of those who have given birth but endured the tragedy of burying their child. And those who have borne a child but have selflessly placed it in the care of another mother through adoption, their grief is often hidden from us or neglected on days of celebration. And we pray that they may experience healing and life in this church family that you have formed. How long, O Lord, must death get its way at the outset of new life How long must joy be deferred or interrupted by such cruel sorrow? Almighty God, we also pray for a special anointing of grace for all those who are foster mothers or stepmothers. We lift up to you those whose children are distant or are wayward. We ask in faith that you would build or rebuild these relationships because you are the risen Lord of life. And we come to you and ask for comfort and peace. Would you breathe in us all the breath of new life through Jesus Christ who has defeated sin and death? We pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hmm. Well, I'm glad to be together with you. Um, We are going to continue taking a walk through a series that we started last week called living as sacrifices. Um, and, and the principle is this. It's, it's a principle I've heard in a, in a couple of different contexts. No one knows quite where the quote came from, but, but the principle is this. That which gets celebrated gets repeated. That which gets celebrated gets repeated. So if you want your kid to, uh, to continue to do their chores, then you want to celebrate them when they have done their chores without having to ask. Now, you know, that might be something that we're praying for. But um, as we're looking at the larger scope, we're looking at our culture, we're asking questions of ourselves and our own hearts. We want to ask, like, what are we celebrating? Who are our heroes? Who are the people that we hold up and that we, um, we want to be like? Are we emulating those who are fulfilling themselves and, and, and uh, inflating themselves? Or um, are we celebrating those who have emptied themselves in service of others. And that's the picture, that's the posture that Jesus had on our behalf. He's emptied himself that that he might win us to God. 
Um, and that's even the life that he calls us into as his followers, right? Uh, it, that's not news, is it? No, okay, right? That's, that's what he's calling us into, to, to be sacrifices, to pour out our lives for others. Like, we're good? Yeah, yeah? okay, all right, cool. Um, so we looked together briefly at, at this, this verse in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Um, and as we, as we kind of opened up there, we, we, we uh, honed in on the fact that typically, if you're presenting a sacrifice, the sacrifice then does not walk away. Like anything that you sacrifice after the sacrifice is over is dead, right? But, but the verses here are saying that we present ourselves as living sacrifices, sacrifices which are not dead but are alive. And, and that's that's a thing. Like, I can lay my life down for somebody else, but it's another thing to then continue to be alive afterwards, right? So what does it look like? What are, what are some guidelines? What are some principles for how we do this thing that Jesus is calling us to, to live as sacrifice? There's a picture here that we actually don't see because we're a little bit uh, separated from the original imagery. And we together have explored a little bit of Passover uh, over the last couple of months, so that might be familiar to us. We talked about the importance of a lamb um, taking our place and, and covering over. Um, do we remember those conversations? That in God's economy, he says, uh, there, there has to be some kind of a sacrifice. And so the sacrifices that you offer have to be without blemish. They have to be pure and they have to be clean. Um, and so uh, if you've got people that are traveling long distances to come to the temple to offer sacrifices, uh, things happen on road trips. Like, have you ever been on a road trip that did not go according to plan? Yeah. All right. So things happen. And so you imagine doing that, not, what, not just with kids in tow, but with literal goats. Like things can happen on road trips and, and, and these are bringing livestock along with them. So when they would get to the temple, there was this little pin. Ooh. <laughs> Speaking of kids. <clears throat> There was this little pin where uh, you would bring your sacrifice and you would like let the lamb walk around. They want to see if it had a limp and the priests would all keep their eyes on the lambs in this pin because th there was a, 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 a season, a time of inspection. The priests were not going to take your word for the, the fact that the lamb was unblemished because the, the priests know as well as anybody else that a, a, a lamb that's lame is cheaper than one that can walk right. So if I can slip in and I can offer like a, a subpar lamb, I'm going to save a little bit of money on the back end, cut down my overhead, and like I can, I can make this work, right? But the priests aren't going to let you slide. They're going to watch your lamb. They're going to watch it walk around for, for maybe even up to days. They'll put the lamb in this observation pen. Now, I, had, I was going to show you a video of YouTube, and it, like there was too much blood, so I didn't do that. But like this is still, this is still a principle that people who are doing these things today are, are still follow. They will watch and inspect the lambs before sacrifice. So when, when Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, I think that this pin is actually the thing that he has in mind. The sacrifices are as good as dead. And yet they are still alive. And so when you come to God in that posture, you come to submit your life for inspection. Submit your life for inspection. And, and, and what's the point of that? This is your spiritual worship. Sacrifices are placed in a space of inspection for alignment with their identity and their calling. They get stuck in that pen because they've been set apart to do something particular. And they lay their lives open. They lay their bodies open. They lay their, everything is open and, 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 and to be observed and inspected to see if they're living in accordance with their identity and their calling. Does that make sense? Sheep-wise? Because it doesn't stay as sheep, right? This is present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Like, how do we submit our lives as inspection, submit our lives as inspection for 
God. And maybe even before we get to the why, it may be helpful to ask the, the, um, the what. What's the goal for inspection? Because as I presented the imagery, the goal is for the thing to die. Like the lamb, it has to be perfect and spotless and, and unblemished in order that it can be a satisfactory covering over sacrifice. Is that what we're going for? Like, are we, are we sub- coming to church and submitting our lives for inspection before the Almighty God so that we can be completely perfect without limps and without uh, any kind of blemish on ourselves? Like, is that the goal? Because I think, I think I thought for a long time that was the goal. That I couldn't come to the body of Christ unless I had already cleaned myself up, unless I was already living that way. I thought that, like, I'm not allowed to go there to be inspected because it will not take them long to realize that I am not worthy. But the goal of this inspection um, is a little bit different because for those who trust in Jesus, There is no possibility of rejection. Romans chapter 8, just a couple chapters before, says this. There is therefore now no condemnation. There is no rejection for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no, we don't come to God with with this like idea of like, okay, I'll lay my life out so you can tell me how I can fix everything because I know I'm not worthy. And like it might I might even get to the point where I've done everything right and now and now you're gonna say, yep, you're not good enough, get out of here. Go home. Like for those who are in Christ, there is no possibility of rejection. Why then does he ask us to submit our bodies as living sacrifice? Why does he ask us to submit to this inspection? What's the goal? It's to synchronize our personal experience with our legal status. To personalize our, or, or to synchronize our personal experience with our legal status. I've, I've used before the imagery of adoption. It's not, I don't remember it being specifically in Romans, but in other places, in other letters, um, they'll say, like, you were adopted by Christ. You have a legal standing. God has taken your last name and given it to, or God has taken your last name away and given you Christ's last name. Like, you belong to his family, and that's a legal process. But then you still, like, even though you've been adopted, legally adopted in the family, you don't know what the table manners go like, because it was very different in the orphanage than it is in the family. And so it, there's a process of learning the roles. And so you've got a, a legal status. Something has been established by law, but my personal experience is not, and my personal expression hasn't been synchronized yet. I'm legally a part of the family, but I don't act that way yet. Right? Well, if, if there's any comfort, like even the author, like the human author of this letter, Paul, says, like, I don't even have this squared away. Like the guy who's, who's giving these truths is like, yo, I'm, I'm still working. I'm still submitting my life as an offering. He says uh, in, in Romans chapter 7, so even before that, Romans chapter 7, verses 18 through 25, he says, I know, I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the or for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who does it, but sin that dwells in me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God and in my inner, inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against, the, uh, against my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Uh, if you're postured like me, like, that's where my thinking typically stops. I'm real good at beating myself up. There's a couple more sentences here for you. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we're looking at ourselves and we're measuring ourselves and we're inspecting ourselves, we will not measure up, but God does not look at us and see us. He looks at us and see Christ's righteousness. 
So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but in my flesh I serve the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The goal of this inspection is to synchronize our personal experience or our personal expression with our legal status. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So, there's a bit of a caveat. I'm assuming for most of us that as we approach this text that we have already come to Christ, that we've already said, I put my faith in him and I have a legal standing before God that is righteous, not on my own account, but on the right of him. Like he says that I'm justified. He says that I'm in the family of God. But, but know that like we need to be, I need to be really clear that that's the first step. If Christ hasn't given you his last name, then, then none of the rest of it matters. If you're not in the family, then I don't actually care whether you act like you're in the family or not. It's not, not my job. Sanctification, if I use church words, can I use church words for a minute? Sanctification comes after justification. So justify would be the legal thing, and then after that is the learning how to operate at the dinner table. Justification precedes, comes before sanctification. If you come to Jesus and you're trying to act and do the table manners and you're like this doesn't feel right, it's like yeah, you didn't even you, you don't you're not you don't have the right last name. Like start there. Come to me, and I'm the one who gives it. It's not that you have to earn it. It's not like you have to act like you don't have to act right before He'll give you that. He'll just give you that because He's kind and He's generous and He wants that for you. His does the. There's some senses in which the will of God is not a mystery. And so I can say a couple of things real, real clear. The will of God is this, that you would trust him for salvation. He wants you to come to him. He wants to put his name on you. And he, for whatever reason, by whatever wisdom that he has that is beyond my comprehension, he lets you decide. Are we trusting Jesus for salvation? We discussed last week that life as a sacrifice starts with earnest prayer to the only one who can save. On your own behalf, come to Jesus and say, Lord, I don't understand all the mechanisms of how it works. I don't know how you could say that me, a sinful person, deserves the righteousness that I didn't even earn and that you yourself have taken upon yourself all the judgment for the sin that I have committed. Like that economy does not make sense to me and I don't really understand, but I need you. Like I know that you're the one that's going to fix this. You're the only one who can, so pray to him. And then, as we become part of the family and we learn and we discover that this is an open invitation, we turn back to the one who can save and say, would you save more? Would you save my family? Would you save my neighbor? Lord knows that they need something. Would you save my coworkers? Would you, would you touch my boss's heart? Lord, would you bless these people in traffic? Would you do something? Earnest prayer, not just for the fact that it would make your life simpler, but for the fact that it's his will that other people would trust him. Life as a sacrifice starts with earnest prayer to the only one who can save. So whom are we praying for? There's a a mystery of dynamics. When you deal with God... We have to do it from where we are, right? And I have not yet figured out how to be in more than one place at a time. Or how to be in more than one time at a place. Right? I can't do that. However, I'm dealing with almighty creator of the universe. Like, he looks at the timeline of history as though it's something separate from him because guess what? It's separate from him. Like, he can see the beginning from the end because he made it all. He's outside the space-time continuum. Okay? 
And so when he says he saves us, there's this legal justification thing that happens, and then he's walking us through this process of sanctification, but at the end of it, he's looking backwards and, and it's applying all of that to Christ, but it doesn't mean that we're off the hook for walking with him and working all these things out, and I don't know how to explain it any clearer than that, and so if it's muddy, like you take it up with Jesus, but here's the thing. <laughs> Jesus has saved you. If you've trusted Jesus, if you cling to him for your salvation, Jesus has saved you. Jesus is saving you. And Jesus will save you. And I don't have the capacity to understand like, the way that that works out in the space-time continuum and, and how like, what we're responsible for, but it seems like he wants us to participate in this in some way that we cannot actually add any value to. So then, if these lambs are placed in a, in, a, in a place of inspection, and we're applying this to ourselves, here's, here's the principle. Sacrifices place themselves in spaces that reinforce their identity and calling. N nobody's going to force you to go to church. You might have some friends or, or people that pester you and you feel like you're being forced, but you're here on your own will. Like you're listening to this on your own, of your own accord. But sacrifices, if we're, gonna, if we're gonna submit our lives for inspection of God, we place ourselves in spaces that reinforce our identity and calling. <clears throat> we're all, like we are whole beings. And did you notice, like, there's this, this interesting dynamic. I'll, I'll read it to you again. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Present your bodies by renewing your mind. It starts in your thinking. And your thinking is influenced by your intakes. Okay. I'm looking at my notes and it seems like I'm out of order, so I'm trying to reshuffle this. Here's, let me, let's, let's step aside just for a moment and let me give you a different example. If we talk about presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice, we talk about your spiritual worship is submitting your life for God's inspection. The question then is this, when we talk about church in particular, what is church supposed to be? Is church supposed to be a museum for those who have gotten their lives together that we can put them up on pedestals and, and wish that we could be as holy as they are? Oh, y'all get it. I like that. Man. Okay, so if church is not a museum, then what is it? It's a hospital. A hospital. Nobody looks at a sick person and calls them a hypocrite for going to the hospital. Like, if we're coming in here, like, we're coming in here with an acknowledgement that I don't have it all figured out, and, and I have some unhealth, and I am going to need the Holy Spirit of God to guide and direct me, and I'm just going to the place where I know that his word is going to be proclaimed, because I need that. Not that I need, not that I need the form or the show or any of that, but I need him, and he promises he'll inhabit the praises of his people, and I, I happen to know where his people are going to be on any given time when it comes to Sunday morning, and so maybe I'm going to place myself there, not because it's a museum for all those who have accomplished it, because it's a hospital for those who are sick, and Lord Jesus, I am sick. Will we submit our lives for Jesus' inspection as is I'm not asking you to have it all organized and polished marble clean plexiglass and security alarms will we submit our lives for Jesus' inspection as is broken plumbing holes in the wall garage door that should have been replaced six years ago Now, we, we may agree in principle, 
okay? But let me just step back. I want to show you something. There may be a logic that we overlook in our habits, and I, I actually find it not in Romans 12, but back in, in Romans 10. So if you want to turn with me to Romans chapter 10, um, I'm going to look at verses 14 through 17. And, and we read these first chapter, or we read these first verses last week, uh, where Paul is is really just outlining his heart and his desire for people to come to the knowledge, the saving knowledge of him. And and Paul specifically in this section is praying for religious people, people who do have it all together, people who might be polished marble. He's praying, God, I pray that you would show them the bankruptcy of their soul, that they might call out to you. And and, and my earnest desire is that they would be actually saved instead of thinking that they have earned their own way. And then he, he, says, he says this in verse 14. How, will, how then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, whom has believed that what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of God. Sacrifices place themselves in spaces that reinforce their identity and calling. Now calling on God for salvation requires belief that God will hear you and that he'll do what he said he's going to do. It's basically, I'm not going to call on somebody who I don't trust, right? So I'm not going to call on God if I don't believe in God. Belief requires hearing and knowing something about the person and the character of that, the person that you were being asked to believe in. And, and, and hearing, like having a knowledge and understanding, requires that somebody is saying it. Somebody is preaching. Now, and if somebody's going to preach... They got to be sent. So a couple of things in your community. I'm just talking to you, you guys in the room, you guys who can hear my voice for you guys. um, God has sent preachers. I'm not the only one. I might be the best looking, but I'm not the only one. God has sent preachers and the good news is being preached So do we put ourselves in spaces to hear the good news that we might believe it and call on God? You have have access to anybody you want to listen to. I'm aware that I'm not just competing with Mario, competing as though we were on different teams. I know that if you're church shopping and you're trying to figure out where to go, like I, I, I would rather go listen to Mario. I listen to Mario more than I listen to my own sermon. So I'm, I'm cool like with us, whatever. But I know that I'm not just, um, just uh, being put up with like uh, other people in Ocala down the street at Good News uh, Church. Like I love those guys, but I know that I'm actually up against like Tim Keller. Or, or whoever it is that you might find to be a really compelling speaker. Like, you have access to every voice that you could possibly want. And I do not presume to be smarter than any of them, or more eloquent than any of them. But I want to encourage you to put yourself in spaces that reinforce your identity and your calling. Because there's a danger. <laughs> And I, I suspect you know it. I probably don't have to describe it. There's a danger that we can build ourselves an echo chamber. That we can surround ourselves with voices that are just going to tell us the things that we want to hear. That the algorithm will reinforce your preferences to your demise. We've fallen down those YouTube rabbit holes. And YouTube won't let us escape them. We, we live in these curated media bubbles. And so uh, we get to choose those things. Like these, these things are actually opt-in. I know it doesn't feel like it, but these are actually opt-in. We get to choose the voices that we listen to. And there's something that happens when you're connected to a local church, like when you're coming to a, a small body like this, because I'm not, I'm not preaching to New York City. I don't care if they ever listen, but I'm preaching to you guys. And I'm, I'm praying for you guys. 
And I'm seeking the face of the Lord that he might give a word that is going to attach itself to your heart by his word. Like, that's, what, that's my desire. And so maybe God's got something that he's going to say to me through you that you did not want to hear today. Because I can tell you, I didn't want to say it. If, if I, I'm not, I don't, I really don't want to make this about me. There's a mystery of like things that happen as you're preparing sermons. And we start a year ahead of time. Like we start praying through what are the things that we're supposed to be working on and what are the texts that we're going to go. And like we're, like there's a labor behind this. And I often end up preaching things I don't want to say. And this is one of them. And yet, if, I'm, if I am asking God to speak through me to the neighbors that he's entrusted for this season and for even this very morning, which is something that I can't anticipate who's going to be in the room on any given morning. So it's like, what is God actually going to do? And I don't have any control over it. So church can often just feel like a waste of time. Like I got other things to do. The weather's nice. The boat is cleaned up. We're ready to go. Like, I don't know how many boats there are that drive, drive past us down 7th Street to get to, the, get to the ocean while we sit here. And, and, which is not, it's not a, mm. <clears throat> is it a waste of time? Here's the thing. When you're doing a workout, and you've got, you've got a set, you're going to do 50 reps of something. What is, what is like the big moral lesson of push-up number 32? <laughs> like if you're doing a set of 50, 32 doesn't really matter that much. And, and, but if you don't do 32, then 33 isn't going to be there. And so I'm not, I'm not advocating that like you have to be in church every time and we're checking your attendance and blah, blah, blah. But I'm saying like if you want to build and you want to grow, then place yourself in, 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 uh, in spaces that reinforce your identity and calling. But we, we go like, God really doesn't care about me, but I also have shut out every place where I could hear his voice. I actually am filling my ears with, with the noise and, and, and the messages that are really just like what I already want to hear. Like there's nobody that's challenging me. <laughs> like, well, Mike just wants the room full so the people who say, yeah, that's 100% not it. Like, you, could find any, you can find any number of better preachers, and I, I hope that you do listen to better preachers than me. <clears throat> but, uh, like, if that were the case, we wouldn't do a podcast. We wouldn't do a live stream. Like, if I wanted to make sure that the room was full, I'd cut off, like, this would be a sealed container so that you could, so that you could only receive it from me in person. And that's not what it's about. Like, the Spirit speaks through His Word. And so if we don't find and purposefully create intersections where we're going to come into contact with his word, then we shouldn't be surprised that we're just led astray by whatever voice is yelling loudest on the TV. But sacrifices place themselves in spaces that reinforce their identity and their calling. And there's one other, there's one other thing that I'll mention before we close. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe on him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? Are we accepting our commission? Like when I say that God has sent preachers, like you're like, oh yeah, that's easy for you to say. Like God has sent preachers into your workplace. Neighborhood church is not confined to this building. Neighborhood church is wherever it is that you happen to show up. Because I think that we together are inviting our neighbors to meet and follow Jesus. And whether they ever walk in the room, walk in here, I don't, I don't care. But I know that Jesus has put you in the lives of unbelievers that you might bring him to them and introduce them to him. That you might then invite them also to follow him. Are we accepting our commission? Whom are we praying for earnestly? to the only one who can say. say. Well, maybe I'm sent to something bigger. Perhaps. I did not plan to come to Ocala. That was not on my 10-year plan, not on my 20-year plan. And here I am. Your fault. <laughs> You're in the room now. <laughs> 
Oh man, I should tell that story. I don't have time. We're closing. <laughs> Sacrifices place themselves in spaces that reinforce their identity and calling. Do that. Don't allow yourself to be, be drowned out in the echo chamber of whatever it is that the person who has paid the most money for the advertisements that are coming on your feed. Place yourself in spaces that reinforce your identity and your calling. Let's pray. Ooh. <clears throat> God, this is hard. Uh, you know how I've wrestled with this um, to even talk about attendance and talk about, you know, media bubbles and those things. Lord, you know my heart. And so, God, I do pray that if there's anything in, in what we've shared or what we've discussed today that's just been my opinion, um, then I pray that all those things would be forgotten real quick. But Lord, if there is truth uh, if your word has been proclaimed, that, that, that you would embed your word in the hearts of those who have heard. That they would believe in you and your word and that they would call on you for their salvation, for their sanctification. Until you come in your glory, we're not without hope. And so, Lord, would you give us eyes to see the choices that we are making that we do not even comprehend as, as, as choices? And would you prioritize, would you help us to prioritize the places that we choose to put ourselves? Would you help us to take every thought captive because it is in our mind that we are renewed in order to be able to present our bodies to you? We thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.